Beyond Australia's Great Barrier Reef out in the Coral Sea, there are hundreds of smaller reefs, mostly uncharted and unexplored. Cyclonic storms and the ceaseless pounding of the surf turn the coral to rubble, and sand caves, like little islands, form atop the reefs. Tragic accidents cause men to discover these caves when they navigate these waters carelessly or when a storm drives them aground. These islands abound in irony. The very caves that can wreck a ship also offer the survivors of those wrecks their first and perhaps last sanctuary. To us, the dazzling white sand and the wonderfully clear water seem beautiful and inviting. Actually, these islands are too barren to support human life. These monuments and headstones, what the castaways left behind, attest to that. Requiring far less than people to survive, the birds and beasts who seek shelter here starve, succumb to predators, and all too often fall victim to the terrible heat of the unsheltered beach, as this giant sea turtle is doing. Their histories, as far as man is concerned, thus begin in tragedy. But just as the coral caves of the Great Barrier Reef gave hope of life to the castaways, they have, before and since, given hope of life to some of the reef's permanent inhabitants. It is to them that the birds and the sea turtles of the coral sea come to nest. It is on them that life begins for the young of these species. Yet as they did for the shipwrecked sailors, the caves impose on the sea creatures seemingly impossible odds against survival. Still, like the men who were driven here by blind chance, many of the creatures who come here out of blind instinct do survive. It is this drama, one of the most moving in all nature, that we will see played out on this stark stage. Crop at the wheel, his wife Eva in the party, and naturalists Carl Limpus and Peter Ogilvy attending to scientific matters, the Beaver, Ben's 48-foot Grand Banks cruiser, sets forth on an expedition. The supervising feline is named Gulliver. They will travel the entire length of the Great Barrier Reef, always keeping to the ocean side of it, so they can explore the caves and reefs of the Coral Sea. The scientists work for the Queensland Park Service, and they are trying to determine which of the small islands should be placed under protection as nature reserves. Their first landfall is Cato Island, a small speck of sand guarded by treacherous reefs. The entrance to the lagoon is narrow, no wider than the boat. One mistake, and the jagged coral could destroy Beaver's hull. At high tide, there's only six inches of water under the keel as Ben takes the boat in, with Eva acting as lookout. breakwater, the sea is as calm as an inland pond. The lagoon's beauty is irresistible to the explorers, and the visibility underwater is almost unparalleled in the diver's experience. seizes the opportunity for archaeological investigation. 
Every ship wrecked on the reef has been tossed over that coral barrier by the ocean swells and has finally settled to the bottom in Cato Lagoon. This anchor belonged to a German sailing ship, the Deckenhuten, which went aground on the reef in 1853, joining such earlier wrecks as the Annie and the Thomas King. Timbers have long since rotted away, but there are dozens of these bronze keel bolts to mark her final resting place. The coral sea reefs are alive with sharks. An anchor dropping, the plunge of a diver, these are enough to attract their attention. Ben is pleased with the chance to add to his library of shark footage. A fish is speared in order to bring the sharks closer to camera. It is standard procedure for him, but this time, the results exceed his expectations. A single fish is not enough to satisfy seven sharks, and they turn savagely on the divers who have to kick for their lives. Oh, jeez. The, um, <laughs> where the few sharks at us? I don't know. I think they're trying to chew us up. Well, did you get it on film? I don't know, Carl. The, uh, I was a bit too busy kicking them up all the time. That I tried to keep my finger on, on their button, but I don't really know. We'll have to see when we process it. The shark attack consumed only 12 seconds worth of film, but it was the most intense 12 seconds Ben Kropp has ever experienced. When he returned home, he had the laboratory print this film in slow motion so that he could study more closely something that happened too fast for any of the participants to recall in accurate detail. The study of sharks is something that is forced upon those who voyage in the coral jungle. But it is not the main business of this expedition. Sea turtles are. One of the chief values of the coral sea caves is as a mating and breeding ground for them. It is January, their mating season. Another male circles this mating pair, then decides three's a crowd. Turtles do everything in slow motion. The female must bear the weight of her spouse for several hours. The weight increases when the supporting tide runs out. Sundown brings welcome relief from the heat of the day, well over 100 degrees in the summer months. The cool of the evening brings the Kay's bird population to life. Nighttime changes the character of life in the waters of the lagoon. Many of its creatures rest when darkness falls, but for others, it offers cover for hunting forays.
Carl Limpus is one of the world's leading experts on marine turtles. The female of the species always emerges from the sea at night to lay her eggs under cover of darkness, when she and her hatch are safest from enemies. counts 110 eggs laid by this turtle during her long and exhausting labor. Meantime, Eva Crop is following the tracks of another turtle. In order for their eggs to be safe, they must be laid above the high tide line, a long, tortuous journey for the mother. Before she can begin to lay her eggs, she must dig out a hole some three feet deep in order to protect them then cover the eggs with sand before she leaves. The female will return to this beach six or seven times every summer to repeat this process. By the end of the breeding season, she will lay up to a thousand eggs. The reason for this enormous productivity is simple. Turtle hatchlings are among nature's most helpless creatures. In 10 weeks' time, they will emerge from these eggs, and no more than 25% will survive the journey down to the beach and through the shallows to the deep sea, where their true struggle for survival will begin. Marine turtles have been a protected species in Australian waters since 1968, but that frees them only from the perils of human killing, perhaps the least of the hazards they face. After Eva leaves, the turtle, now nearly exhausted by her labors, faces the most difficult portion of her journey. She must find her way back to the sea, to which she is much better adapted, without falling prey to the many traps this terrain presents to her. If she's caught on land after the sun rises, the heat could kill her. This is one of the fortunate ones. Cato Island Beach can be a pleasant place to stroll if you have a well-equipped boat anchored nearby to live on. The automated weather station warns the Australian mainland when tropical storms approach. Another reason for the ecological importance of the coral cays is that they serve as nesting grounds for thousands upon thousands of birds. These are gannets. The mother's pulsating throat signals her anxiety about her chick when strangers are near. Sooty terns are the most numerous element in Cato's bird population. Day in, day out, seagulls prey on unattended eggs and on the defenseless chicks. The mother may briefly defend her clutch, but most of them appear to be surprisingly indifferent to such natural disasters. Each of these chicks has lost its mother. When one mother locates her chick, she's happy to take both wanderers under her wing.
Meanwhile, the other mother, confused and angry, searches for her offspring. When she finds it, she vents her anxiety on the baby's rescuer. It's not easy to grow up in a turn colony. Everyone looks alike, and curiosity is usually rewarded with anger. The colony's indifference to the problems of the individual chick is complicated by the fact that there is usually not enough food to go around. Many offspring just don't make it to maturity. Turns squabble endlessly over their places in the colony. The young acquire their feisty habits from their parents. A turn colony is like an overcrowded city. A family quarrel can flare into a dispute that involves the entire neighborhood. Waters in this region are rich in food for the terns, and the adult birds are constantly on the wing trying to fulfill the needs of their ever hungry young. The adults pre digest their catch in their gullets, then regurgitate it into the beaks of their chicks. Yet, despite the apparent abundance of the food supply, some of the chicks do go hungry. A growing colony of terns simply requires more food than the sea can supply, or the overburdened adults can carry back to their offspring. The heat of the caves takes a terrible toll on the birds, draining their strength. And if they've overextended their energy in the hunt for food, it renders them unconscious. Left unaided, these birds have died on the beach. Eva Krop, along with her friends Bob and Gina Stevens, members of the boat's crew, cannot stand nature's cruelty. They spend the day rescuing and reviving the exhausted birds. If the young life of cave birds, like the terns, is hard, the beginning of a turtle's existence is almost unbearable to contemplate. Almost all their meager reserves of strength are used up in the struggle to hatch. Immediately, they must head for the sea, since they have no hope of surviving for more than a few hours on land. Each dip and rise in the terrain presents a potentially fatal obstacle. Any bit of beach foliage can represent a possibly deadly entanglement. The geography of the Kays is the least formidable of the hazards the hatchlings face. The gulls are always on the alert for food, and the defenseless turtles, their unformed shells offering no protection, are easy prey. are among the very few out of the hatch to make it to the water. Even there, however, 
They're not safe from the aerial onslaught. Nor is there safety in the ocean itself. There, the fish wait the survivors of the ordeal on land. Again, one of the hatchlings makes a lucky escape. Still, by air and sea, the uneven and deadly struggle continues. When it is all over, only a single hatchling is left alive, swimming desperately for the vastness of the open ocean where predators may overlook it. All summer long, the timeless and tragic drama of the young turtle's fight for life is reenacted on the beaches of the coral sea caves. At the edge of the sea, an enemy waits, a ghost crab. The trip down the sand dune is dangerous. If it loses its balance and flips onto its back, the turtle may never be able to right itself and continue its journey. The turtle survives its trek across the sand wastes, only to fall into the grip of the ghost crab. It manages to twist itself free, but fate for this creature is sealed. Stumbling into a branch, it finds it cannot free itself. Ever the opportunist, the ghost crab sees the turtle's plight and moves in for its merciless kill. Many more reefs and caves to explore, and accompanied by a flashing school of dolphins, Ben Crop's expedition heads now for Wreck Reef, 60 miles to the north. by Matthew Flinders, the man who first charted the Great Barrier Reef in 1803. Flinders thought his safest course was to keep to the seaward side of the reef. He was unaware of the coral caves, and both of his ships ran aground here. Eighty survivors straggled ashore here on this spot bringing with them 11 cannons and several hundred cannonballs, some of which Ben now salvages. The weapons were of no use against the real enemies of the castaways, hunger, thirst, and heat. These they endured for six weeks, while Flinders, in a remarkable feat of seamanship and endurance, rode 600 miles back to Sydney for a rescue ship. The Gannets watch. This nervous play with nesting material is their only response to the intruders. While Ben Crop and his party go about their salvaging activities, these terrestrial hermit crabs find shelter from the heat of the sun beneath a rock. They will emerge when it is cooler to feed on the dead birds they find along the shore. This one has decided to exchange the cramped shell he borrowed some time earlier for something a little roomier and more suited to his growing needs. Thank you. 
Crabs are well along an evolutionary path that has led them from life in the sea to life on land. They now need only one short swim per day in order to survive on land. The cannonballs remain in excellent condition. Chemical treatment will remove the sea salts that have corroded them. They will be donated to a historical museum. In addition to Flinders ships, the Cato and the Porpoise, six other sailing vessels were cast up on Wreck Reef in the 19th century. Little remains of them now in the waters of the lagoon. snake stands guard over the remains of the antique ships. Its mood, however, is more curious than defensive. The explorer's next destination is Lizard Island, another 150 miles north. In 1770, Captain Cook, the first great explorer of the South Pacific, stood on this hill to look for an opening through the reefs for his ships. team with life. This turtle is probably on her way to one of the island's nesting grounds. This potato cod weighs about 40 pounds. Those spots are the male's way of advertising that he's available. They will disappear after he finds a mate. In contrast to most of the Coral Sea Islands, the terrain of Lizard Island has a lushness that compares very favorably to the richness of the seas around it. There's even a small rainforest, luxuriant in foliage to explore. irresistible. One expects to find lizards in a rainforest. They seek it out for the same reason the explorers do, because it is cool and refreshing. This friendly thing is known as a skink. On the beach, the explorers find the wreckage of the Capricorn, lost in a cyclone last year. The wreckage had drifted 1,000 miles to this island. The lizards of Lizard Island also inhabit the beach, and their story is a remarkable one. This little island-dwelling gecko, Lepidodactylus, it'll be a female. We can tell this for sure because there's no males known for this particular type of lizard. She'll be carrying two eggs, but she'll normally lay these in a crevice of a tree. 
With no males in the population, it means that the females can produce eggs that don't require any fertilisation. It, of course, means that for this species, they can colonise an isolated island like this with just a single lizard reaching it on driftwood, being able to reproduce without a mate having come along with it. A lone turtle stranded on the beach gives Call and Peter an opportunity to gather scientific data. There's still much to learn about turtle growth and their migratory habits. Measuring the turtle is no problem. 16 and a half. Head, 108. Tag number X, 1851. Oh, the turtle's shell has been punctured as it crawled over the coral of the reef. Scales. Weighing this character is no easy task. The scientist's scale weighs in kilograms. In non-metric terms, that means 385 pounds. When this turtle is spotted again, the scientist will be able to discover how far it has traveled and how much it has grown. The new information will be compared to the data they have just noted. The expedition's final destination is Rain Island. It is a famous, even notorious, turtle breeding ground, presenting more natural hazards both to nesting females and their hatchlings than any of the caves where they come to renew their species. The beach is covered with the tracks of turtles which came here the night before to nest. The scientists estimate that 400 of them assaulted the beach on a single evening. Ben and his party know this island. They know what awaits them is evidence of a tragedy that endlessly repeats itself. 19th century explorers, surveying what seemed to them a mass graveyard, believed the marine turtles came to Rain Island to die. That is not true. They came here seeking to renew their species. But the island is a natural death trap for them. Some of them, returning from inland to the sea, fall over precipices, land helplessly on their backs, and die with agonizing slowness. Others get wedged between rocks and die because they cannot crawl backwards. Some dig too deeply into the soft beach sand when they lay their eggs, and it collapses on them. Still others become disoriented on the open beach and die of heat exhaustion. The expedition counts the corpses of 680 females who have died this summer alone.
Eva Crop comes across a turtle that has fallen on its back. It may have been lying this way for days or weeks. Unbelievably, it is still alive, and helping hands offer its salvation. There you are, girl. It is weakened by dehydration and desperately requires water. Kong and Peter believe, however, that it is still strong enough to make its own way back to the sea. Men once believed they could live in this harsh environment. In the 19th century, there was, briefly, a guano mining operation on Rain Island. Later, a tower was erected to serve as a beacon and as a shelter for those who missed its warning signal. Convicts cut this five-foot-thick masonry from the beach rock. Reward for their labor was a six-month reduction in sentences. According to the inscription carved in the wall, if a castaway has the strength and means to dig seven feet to water, he has a fair chance to survive. Nightfall brings an end to exploration. The next morning, they find the turtle they thought they had saved. It had died during the night. They overestimated its strength and ability to return to the sea. As they continue their explorations, the party discovers other turtles trapped alive under ledges all along the beach. They will not repeat their first mistake. All living turtles will be dragged right into the water so they'll have the best possible chance to survive. It's hard labor but rewarding. Buried under a rock fall, this turtle was first passed up for dead. It's a long haul to the beach, and the temperature is 126 degrees in the open. In all, Ben Crop and his party returned 13 turtles to the sea during this hard day's work. I think the best way of this one, though, we won't roll it here. We'll drag it, I think. Uh, short way to the beach. You put a rope on the far flipper. Steady, girl. Oh, gee, you've been here a long time, girlie. Oh, you don't appreciate what we're doing. Right, 
In the intense 126 degree heat, the cool water is as refreshing to Call and Peter as it is to the turtles. Of course, Call and Peter tag the turtles hoping to add everything they can to the body of scientific knowledge about them. Even at night, the quest for scientific information continues. Call wants to count how many of these eggs actually hatch. Rain Island is the world's largest turtle rookery. One night, observers counted 14,000 turtles crawling up the beach to nest. They estimate that the annual total is close to 200,000 and that 100 million hatchlings are produced here. A surprisingly large number of hatchlings have made it to the water tonight. Eva and the scientists keep a watchful eye on them, knowing that sharks have congregated offshore to await them. Hoping to improve the turtles' odds slightly, they've hooked one of the sharks. The creature is not yet dead. And neither is the hatchling it recently swallowed. It struggles to survive its captor's death throes and fails. In death, the enemy shark becomes a resting place for the hatchlings, a place to pause before continuing their swim for the open sea. Sharks seem to instinctively know when the young turtles will begin their migration to the sea. They're always there, waiting for them. The scientists decide to perform an autopsy on one of them. It's not a pleasant task, but it does give them some idea of how extensive the creature's diet is. and that means more trouble for the turtle hatchlings in the form of a cruel deception. Experience has taught the sharks that a storm brings the young turtles out in daylight when they're even easier prey for the marauders. The storm blocks the sun, the rain cools the sand, and the waiting hatchlings, thinking night has come, emerge from their hiding place. Down the beach they come, an innocent parade. In the surf, the sharks take full advantage of nature's sinister trick. To the human watchers, the situation is unbearable. Some of those sharks are man-eating whalers, but the members of the expedition don't care. They must try to help the turtle hatchlings as best they can. the magnitude of the destruction Rain Island visits on the turtles who try to begin life there and so often find death. The rescuers' efforts will amount to little more than a gesture. But it is by such gestures that we measure our humanity and define the difference between us and the other creatures with which we share the world.
midst of death, life prevails. The sufferings we've witnessed are pathetic, seemingly senseless. Yet the fact remains that the majority of hatchlings make it to the comparative safety of deep water. Rain Island returns more turtles to the ocean, to their natural element, than any other nesting ground we know of. What seemed the tragedy as we witnessed it turns out to be a miracle of sorts, a thing that properly fills us with awe and wonder.